Round Hay Garden is the earliest example of film ever, ever found. Made in 1888 by Louis de Prince, it consists of just two seconds of film and runs at about 12 frames per second. The early, early film and how that was created and invented has always been quite controversial because there's so many claims. From Edison, who of course claimed originally to have the, the patent and the, uh, the invention of, of cinematography, that the Lumiere brothers became the first two to project film to audiences. And in that way, I think they're considered to be the fathers of cinema and film, projected film. People may be familiar with is the arrival of the train. And it, it is told, the story is told, that audiences at the time were so unfamiliar with moving images and moving pictures that they quite literally, as they saw this train arrive in the station, they would get up and move away from the seats because they were panicking as if the train may come through the screen. German newspapers at the time reported one short film had a particularly lasting impact. Yes, it had caused fear, terror and even panic. Although the cinematographic train was dashing towards the crowded audience in a flickering black and white manner, the spectators felt physically threatened and panicked. It wouldn't be until the French pioneer Georges Méliès that people really began to use films as a way to tell a story. His most famous work, A Trip to the Moon, was made in 1902 and would show one of the most famous shots in cinema. Nineteen o three would mark one of the first landmarks in cinema, with the early film studio, the Edison Factory, producing the Great Train Robbery. The ten minute film would be the first Western film and would pioneer in special effects and editing. Great Train Robbery was significant for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's the first time that we see what we now consider to be the, the, the genre of westerns. So you see this very early pre-Western genre film with the iconography used in the film. But mostly um, the director, Edwin S. Porter, um, for the first time uses very carefully constructed cross-cutting and editing techniques that moves the action more quickly forward. So it's also got this amazing final shot but still is striking to audiences today if it's on a big screen where the, the Western character gunman at the end just holds a gun at the screen and fires at the audience. So, as you can imagine, sort of less than 10 years after the invention of cinema, this was quite a powerful, impacting film. Within the next 10 years, the first regular cinemas were built. These were called Nickelodeons because of their five cent or nickel admission. By 1907, there would be over 3,000 Nickelodeon cinemas across America. But by 1912, cinemas were being built on a much grander scale and were nicknamed palaces. Along with the now much grander scale of the movies, admission prices doubled and by the 1920s, motion pictures were becoming a big business. One of the most prominent figures of the cinema began his career within the silent era. D.W. Griffith began in 1908 by directing The Adventures of Dolly. He made around 450 motion pictures between 1908 and 1913, but a majority of these are lost or destroyed. His greatest achievement would be in the 1915 with the epic The Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation is significant because it's, it's a three hour silent film, so it wasn't the first ever feature but it certainly is and was the most significant feature film of all time and the most successful transition from film being thought of as a kind of curiosity, moving the new moving pictures into becoming an art form. Highly controversial now, and, and rightly so because of its inherent racist content. It tells the, the story following the end of the Civil War, um, from the perspective of the southern states and it has this unfortunate portrayal of the, the Ku Klux Klan as quite heroic figures saving people from 
uh, the worst excesses of, of black African uh, Americans in the, in the South. The star of the picture was Lillian Gish, who had worked with D.W. Griffith since the beginning of her career in 1912 in the short film An Unseen Memory. Very quickly Lillian Gish seemed to have this very natural talent for acting and uh, performing on screen, very compelling. And she became um, a very highly regarded, renowned and well paid and much loved silent film actress. As she moved towards the end of the 20s, she was so powerful that she would be able to choose the, um, the screenwriter for her films and choose the director. So, so she had a lot of power in the system, I think, as she was a very powerful woman. And I think she contributed significantly to film history, not just as an actress. As a child, she moved to New York and became friends with the next door neighbour, Gladys Smith, who worked as a child actress for D.W. Griffith. Gladys took the stage name of Mary Pickford and began her career in motion pictures in 1909. Mary Pickford was, was working with D.W. Griffith in some of the biograph shorts. And again, if you look at those lovely films from 1910s too, you can see her in these wonderful sequences. She, she was so popular in the biograph films with Griffith that fans would write in and say, who's that woman who is in this film? And um, under some pressure, her name was released as Mary Pickford. And she was confident enough to say to Griffith, who was the, the finest filmmaker of the time probably, and certainly the best known and very popular, um, that she was prepared to leave the studio to go independent. Clara Bow was part of the first generation to grow up on motion pictures and won her chance to appear in the film Beyond the Rainbow. After one viewing, her scenes were to end up on the cutting room floor. She appeared in over 30 films until her performance in the 1927 film It. Clara Bow was very different to the other actresses at the time, like Mary Pickford and Lillian Gish. She had a very different sort of visual persona. Um, and she famously was known as the It Girl, which was something that Eleanor Glynn had coined. And she'd written a, an article and then a book. And it was, it, it was an indefinable quality of sensuality and sexuality. Um, expressed with a sort of confident indifference, really. So, kind of indefinable. And I guess other people, difficult to know how to describe that in today's terms, but I guess someone like Marilyn Monroe, you might say, had it. Or perhaps for some people, it might be David Beckham today. There's a quality of uh, confidence and sexuality. But, but Clara Bow, um, in her films of the 20s, is very different. When you see her, she looks modern, she's a jazz age flapper, and she's, um, she's open to, she's not bound by the conventions at the time. She's got it, and plenty of it, brother, she's got it. I never saw another have so much of such and such. Well, she's really not exquisite, but after all, what is it, lips and eyes? Just like a million others, still what made me fall. Why, it ain't that, and that ain't it. That is that, and it is it, and she's got it. That's all. Comedy ages quicker than any other film genre, and yet silent comedy is still popular among audiences. Charlie Chaplin is by far the most well-known of all silent era stars because of his iconic tramp look and slapstick comedy. He had this innate comic genius in his bones and in his body that was able to produce a performance that was balletic and athletic, um, exquisite timing. Um, so you see something like The Rink where he's on roller skates doing this dance, a ballet with um, with the, the other performer and uh, it's just extraordinary to see him perform in that way and what was different about Chaplin and, and significant and important was his ability very early on to take over the reins of directing as well as acting 
So he became the creator of his own work, he would write his own work, he would direct his own work and very quickly produced his own studio, his own ensemble that he would work with and there weren't many people that had that kind of control over their work in the 1920s. Because I think more broadly with slapstick and physical comedy, when it's done well, and I think Laurel and Hardy do it very well in the silent days, um, when it's done well it's always about the kind of comedy of misfortune. So I think that when people see um, somebody who's, who has great wealth or great power or great status and that pomposity is pricked by somebody who's the underdog um, in some way, people are still amused by that and captivated by that. So people can still resonate with the, you know, the trauma of trying to carry a piano up the stairs and it keeps falling back down or something of that kind. So I think that the very best slapstick comedy is still funny. In 1919, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbank and D.W. Griffith formed the United Artists with the intention of controlling their own interests rather than depending upon powerful commercial studios. The formation of United Artists was important because for the first time performers who saw the value in their work and I think their contribution in the star system, their value, they wanted to take some control back from the studios and increase their own revenue and understand their own worth really. And they wanted the creative um, control of being great artists and being able to produce their films from their vision, and all four of those did that significantly well. Years later, Mary would tell journalists, we were pioneers in a brand new medium, everything's fun when you're young. In 1927, Warner Brothers released the first full talking picture called The Jazz Singer. It would signal the beginning of the talking picture and the end of silent cinema. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you, you ain't heard nothing. You want to hear Tootsie? All right, hold on. After the jazz singer was released, the studios were reluctant to come on board with Warner Brothers because they thought it was just a fad and it would pass. Um, but over time, they could see that audiences were demanding these kind of sensational talking, singing, movies, pictures. And gradually, and I think it's a great tragedy, the studios, not only did they invest significantly in sound studios, um, but they did something that's unforgivable today, which is they then, in order to make new sound talkies cinema uh, viable and sustained, and for their investment to sustain, they did not want audiences to return to silent form in any way. So they then began to uh, give audiences the impression that new talkies were everything and old-fashioned silence, they were terrible and they were antiquated and they were basic and they were simple and they were uninteresting. And I think that them demolishing their previous work has led to them not being archived. In 2013, it was estimated that 70% of American silent films are lost or in an incomplete state. Silver was, um, was recovered from the films, so the value of the film stock was greater than the content of it, whereas now we don't think in the same way. That's one of the reasons, plus nitrate footage was incredibly fragile um, and uh, combusted and flammable, so uh, a lot of the film was lost because of accidents and fires in archives and this kind of thing. and representing these films and the kind of work that the film festival I'm involved in, Slapstick Festival, do to represent them to audiences, to say, hey, look at this, this is amazing. And we never think that silent films are better than talkie films, because they're not. But the best are as good as the best talkie films. And it's something about the, the magic of film, whether it's, if it's a good film, it doesn't matter whether it's a dialogue-led film or it's a silent film. Um, but it's just, is it a good film? and is it well made, really? So it, 
the development of film transformed through this dramatic kind of collapse of silent film through the jazz singer and a lot was lost and we have gained a significant amount since and you still have films like The Artist being made so there's still an opportunity to celebrate that medium but to all intents and purposes it's, it's, it's not the same today and would never be the same yeah. again. When D.W. Griffith was asked why he didn't like talking pictures, he replied, it is my arrogant belief that we have lost beauty.